On this episode, my childhood coach, Tony Roth, stops by. Hey everybody, I'm Tarek Merchant and this is the I'm Recruitable Show. I'm super excited today to be here with uh, Tony Roth, um, coached me since I was a little kid. We're here in Ottawa at the Roman Cup, a big tournament that's been going on for a number of years. Um, each of the draws, I believe, have a national qualifying spot, right Tony? That's right, yeah. And so it's a big tournament, uh, I think there's 400 plus entries here and um, great opportunity for these kids to to you know, get themselves noticed, get ex the exposure they need, the opportunity to get to the national level. Um, you're here now in Ottawa for a number of years. Um, I'd love to hear your story, um, your background, um, and, and telling our viewers here who are listening. I mean, what we do on the show is, is we're trying to educate parents and student athletes about the process. But one of the things that I'm realizing now is that um, you know, when I'm talking to families about, okay, here's where you're at today and this is the opportunities you're going to have for college tennis um, this is the types of scholarships you could earn it's often where they are now as a junior or senior in, in high school you know grade 11 grade 12 kid and uh, when I'm talking to the younger generation it's telling them what they need to do in the process and where they need to be but how as a player do you get to that level and I think that like that's one of the things that's been very interesting to me because I've been talking to a lot of um, you know high performance coaches like yourself who have you know given me their different avenues and advice and I'm getting parents that come to me and say alright well if my son or daughter wants to play for Duke one day you know academically you're telling me they need to be here so I have that school component but on the tennis side you know to get to a UTR you know for guys 13 14 above and for girls you know 9 10 11 etc at the highest level like how do we do that how do we work with our coaches so uh, let's start off by giving your, your story your background and we'll get into some of that stuff okay that sounds good well my story is uh, basically one of those kids who from the first time a racket was put in my hand for some reason I just couldn't stop playing the game it just grabbed me and I, I didn't want to do anything else much. It was always on my mind. It just grabbed hold of me. And uh, so, yeah, my family moved to Kingston uh, from New Brunswick. Okay. And, uh, and that's how I, I didn't even discovered. know that, by yeah, the way. <laughs> I discovered the Kingston Tennis Club and, uh, and just was hanging out there all the time, and just like you did later yeah. on. And I just couldn't get enough. And then um, uh, Jason Taylor, uh, another Kingston boy who was into tennis a lot, uh, we went to a, a camp, one week camp in London run by the All Canadian Tennis Academy, which was Pierre Lamarche's first okay. yep. incarnation of his academies. And we did a camp week there. And at the end of it, Ari Novik, who's now the director of coaching development, for Canada but in that time he was working with Pierre at his academy okay and he said look you guys seem to really like tennis we like your attitude you work hard you should come to our year-round Academy or to consider it okay so I went home and said I'm going yeah so uh, so I went there for three years and did a lot of training tons of volume uh, lived in a house with 20 other out-of-town kids uh, okay. with a couple of supervisors and we played tournaments almost every weekend we trained three four hours a day and um, and you know got up to the point where I was making nationals and stuff like that and then just decided at the end of that for me personally that I just wasn't going to go the route that most of my peers were going which was to go to the states okay just for some reason I just knew that that wasn't quite the way Why? I wanted to go I think it was partly it was just an, for me it was an intuitive thing I didn't feel like my life path was necessarily to pursue competitive tennis to a professional level okay um, and and so it just it just it was funny it was one of those weird things it's very hard to explain but I just knew that's not what I'm doing with my life okay uh, I still love tennis and I want to be involved in tennis but I moved back and uh, I, I went to Queens and, and did uh, still playing a lot of tennis. Started teaching in Kingston, yeah. playing for the varsity team, which and we had a decent OU double. You had a good team. There. You had a great team. And actually. the competition was pretty good. Like yeah. I, I was when I lost matches, it was to guys who had played junior Wimbledon, and it was pretty good stuff. Yeah. Um, and then and then I did a lot of years at Queens because I did an undergrad and then another undergrad and then a masters. So I was there quite a while. And yeah. uh, and then I got to the point where I was doing a lot of certification stuff with Tennis Canada. They started asking me if I would be a provincial coach, touring coach, national coach, and so I decided that I would follow that path rather than doing a PhD and following the academic path. Okay, and, and, uh, and yeah. so did you know, like you said, from a young age, um, when that choice of going to college yeah. in the States or in yeah. Canada, and that you didn't want to really pursue that avenue, it was more, um, did you know you wanted to coach? Or did you fall Not into that because you started coaching, you know, 
Because you enjoyed it. No. You love tennis. You make this for money during college. Yeah. No, it wasn't. No. It wasn't such a linear thought process for me. Okay. I didn't know what I was going to do. Okay. Uh, but I just knew that. And tennis for me was always a little bit. Um, for me personally, I mean, I love the training. I love the discipline. I love the hard work, um, and and I, and the challenge of competition and all of that. But it also had for me always kind of a deep kind of a philosophical element. Yeah. Um, when my dad asked me why should I spend another. It was the I think the tuition was ten thousand five hundred dollars, and that was back in the late eighties. Yeah, it's quite a bit of money. Yeah. And I said, uh, and and I hadn't rehearsed the answer. And I said, you know, I think I'm learning what it means to be a human being because of tennis. So for me, it yeah. was kind of a profound feeling about tennis, and uh, and that's what led me to write eventually to write Noble Tennis, the my the book I wrote, um, because I felt like I was doing so much with the certification with Tennis Canada yeah. and the National Coaching Institute, and a lot of great material coming out of it. I felt like something was being not discussed enough, and that okay. was about how where does the human being fit into this, and how does how does working with the human being and the qualities of a human being, how if at all does that affect the performance of the player, and. Besides that, over and above that, what are we doing here? Since most people aren't going to play pro necessarily or do things like, what, what are we doing in a bigger sense? Right. And then how does that relate also to when you're playing in the zone, which qualities are predominating? Because they're not usually the ones associated with anger and frustration and all this. So there seemed to be a connection between functioning well as a human being yeah. and functioning well as a player. And I didn't agree with the idea that, you know, good guys finish last and all that kind of stuff. I thought, no, no, it seems like when people play their best, even John McEnroe, the best match I ever saw him play, he didn't yeah. say one word. And then he, he got mad at the crowd out. Is that even possible? I, was, I don't think I've ever seen a match when he hasn't said listen, one word. Listen, look it up. Okay? Yeah. I was at the U.S. Open okay. quarterfinals, 1986, I think it was. Okay. He played Joachim Nystrom, who was about 10th in the world at that time. Beat him 6-1, six, 6-love, six, 7-5. And it was magnificent. McEnroe was in the zone and he didn't make a sound and the crowd was getting on him like they wanted the show Yeah, and of course McEnroe being McEnroe got pissed off at the crowd for not appreciating Shitting that he wasn't yeah. yeah, and he said I'm putting on a display of tennis here like it is so great Yeah, you're, is that not you're good whistling enough? at me. <laughs> yeah, so um, which I thought was a bit rich on his part I mean, Yeah, you create a persona that that's why people come to see you and then right, yeah. but anyway that was sort of what I was interested in and um, and then, and then got into teaching and found that for me, working with people in teaching while still competing, yeah. which I think is important for coaches that... You, you competed know. a lot. I mean, when you yeah. were, the whole time I oh, was yeah. working with you, That's I mean, right. until I moved back to Toronto. That's right. You were competing at the high level. Like, well, you were one of the top players in, in, the, in right. the open. I was ranked number yeah, one in Ontario. Right, yeah. And I, it was funny because I said to my own teacher, um, you know, I, I said one year, um, I'm going to take this year and not teach too much. I'm going to compete. Okay. And the reason why I'm doing it is because I have a feeling that what I'm saying in Noble Tennis is, is, is true, but I don't want to put something out there to other people unless I've really run it through myself. Fair so enough. I competed that summer, and I won quite a few tournaments, and I ended up ranked number one that year. Yeah. And then I said, okay, this book can be published. Right. Because it's not just abstract. Because it already seems a little abstract to people. Right. You're talking about But qualities. you actually did it. But I, so I wanted and to you proved it. And kind of proved it. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that was, and got into teaching and found that I really, that seemed to be what I was made for. And somehow, intuitively, when I was younger, I kind of knew that that was going to be more my path, even though I think it is very important for coaches, especially coaches that are working with people that are competing. Yeah. Um, I find it important, like, you have to be working on, it's good if you're still playing, hitting, working on your game and stuff like this because the empathy fa factor, sometimes coaches stand apart, you know, and, and it's not that you have to be playing high level competition or anything, but I think it's valuable when players, not only in the past, yeah. just to have that little bit of engagement where I'm still trying to improve too in whatever way that may be. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so that, so then I got more and more into teaching and eventually started the Noble Tennis School based on the book. Yeah. And we started a part of the Noble Tennis when you, when we were in Kingston right. together. So when we were in Kingston, yeah. the book had been you, published. Yeah. yeah. I remember you gave and gave us your first draft. Okay. I mean, you know, and you asked us to read a good, you know, getting some critiques yeah, and that's information. Right. That's I, right. Yeah. I wanted to know how it struck everybody. And funny, here's a funny story not many people know about that book. The first version of that book that I wrote yeah. was a 350 pages long. Okay. Now, I had been going to Queen's doing academic, really academic work. And so the book had a, kind of an academic flavor to it. I had been studying a lot of philosophy, both at Queen's, both in their curriculum and outside of it on philosophy. Eastern philosophy and then in Queens more the Western. So the book came out and it was long and it had footnotes and it was a bit academic and I gave it again to my teacher and I said please read this and tell me what you think. 
and she said, uh, I don't think you've quite found your own voice yet. Okay. Oh. <laughs> 350 pages later. So I said, you know what, I don't want to hear this right now. Yeah. And so, funny enough, Link, that we're here today having this interview because what happened was that summer I came here and I was the pro at this club for one summer, the Ottawa okay. Tennis and Lawn. Okay. And that was when I had just finished that draft. And I, I about two months later after my, that comment was made, I picked, up the, I picked up the book and I said, I'm just going to see, I'll take a red pen and see if there's anything that doesn't seem quite right. Right. Every page. You're so just I, marking it I up. burned it. Really? Yeah. And you just started over? Started over. You felt like it was just so much mark, marked up that you couldn't it even was, take it. She was, yeah. as always, yeah. my teacher was so right. Yeah. It was just like, there's no way I'm going to put this out as this book. Okay. So then eventually I made the version that eventually came came out. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, so that was went through. But yes, we were working with it when you when I was teaching you. Yeah. 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 Incredible. No, I always love to hear you know everybody's story. I get all the college coaches, anybody I'm talking to, discussing, interviewing their story, and it seems like everyone's got the same parallel that that people you know at home really need to understand is like. Tennis brings, and sports, brings so much more than just mm -hmm. the game. You know, and everybody has their own unique pathway, and that there isn't an exact, like, written way right. of how to do it, and right. where to go, and everybody's an individual person, but overall, everyone's getting this unbelievable experience mm -hmm. out of it. Not only on the court and their success as an athlete, but off the court right. as their success, you know, as a, right. as a person, and like, yeah. even me, like, um, you know, I, I, I was a chance I was going to go to McGill. I signed up to go to McGill University. Wasn't going to take the opportunities I had down south. Correct. And then all of a sudden, I changed. And I had similar feelings you did. But like everybody grows differently. And now here's where I am and, and where you are, and both in successful paths. But yeah. you know, I'm taking different path, roads right. to get there. Right. So and you mature at different times. So right. I, th I thought that was really interesting. Well, that's um, it. You know, and, that, and the thing is, is that. Like, what does a person need when they're, it, it, the education process they experience through their home life, through their schooling, uh, and, and through whatever extracurricular things they do? I mean, you need a mind that can concentrate and that can operate. Uh, you need a, an emotional nature that is learned to be stable. You need stability and you need the ability to concentrate and you need the ability to notice things and adjust and and you need a physical body that is that is not going to be that is healthy and that is coordinated yeah these are things we need ever since plato wrote his book about education yeah it's like obviously this is what human beings need to carry on a good life right. period right so it's not abstract to say oh yeah it's good for because people shake their head like this and then after that it's like all i want to know is did you you know win your last match or something which is not putting that down it's important results and performance but to really deeply profoundly understand what's going on with a person I mean, yeah i just watched a guy play one of my students yeah and i mean this is a guy who in the last six months has gone from being just a mess on the court in a tournament just unable to to function and now he's out there and he's 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 dancing around and he's staying positive he, he won the first set six two the other guy changed his strategy my player didn't respond correctly tactically, but he kept trying, he kept fighting, he kept looking down three love in the third, then he fights back, and I mean, it, he lost six four in the third. But I mean, this is a guy now, all of a sudden, a guy who would have had a meltdown after two love in the second, has a chance, is now showing the focus, the stability, the positivity, uh, the engagement to enjoy the whole process. And I said, like, you do that for another year or two, and you're going where you want to go. Right. And that's about him. Uh, it, as well as the skills. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about your coaching philosophy, everything. Like, uh, you know, I remember growing up, and I think we started, I mean, we were, John McFarlane was, you know, the first coach I, I sort of had in Kingston as he was on his way out, and then his son Scott took over, and you were still in school, but I was still working with you as one of the coaches, and then I think it was around 10 years old, I was, must have been about 10, when I started working closer with you, yeah. and Scott decided to go teach uh, school, right. you know, full time, yeah. and um, so you were very young, mm -hmm. you know, you were still uh, yeah. in college, you yeah. know, and you were a university student, um, but we always, you, in a lot of ways you were very mature, you always had that mentality of, of, of your unique teaching methods, and I think like a group of us really latched onto that, I felt like we could work really hard on the court, 
and we were serious, but then we could have some fun too. Yeah. And that you were a real fun guy and you do love your donuts. Yeah. That, that, I, that I can't forget. But at the same time, when we're playing matches, we're going on road trips. Like we were on a yeah. strict diet and there was no fooling around because if you're there to compete right. and if you want to be a good player, you had to act and train like one. Right. So now fast forward, you know, many years that yeah. you've been doing this, you've had so much success with kids going down to college. I mean, I never really had another coach that could I could relate to or train the way you and I did. And I know that vice versa, there's people who enjoy other relationships. Everybody's gonna find their way. But now that you've been doing it, you've been you've got so much success with kids going down to the US or having successful tennis careers. You know, what is it that you guys teach? What's your philosophy? What what do you do at the Noble Tennis School that's so unique? Well that that allows, you know, for this type of success. Right. Well, I mean there's a, there's a few things I think that are important. One, um, I mean, the background, the atmosphere is as we've been discussing. Right. It came out of the first, uh, the first part of Noble Tennis. And, and an understanding of what it's like to be a player. Uh, you know, I think that empathy of being a player there. And I think, yeah, like, I mean, we, um, and we do focus on the fact that there needs, there is an enthusiasm. The first chapter of Noble Tennis is on enthusiasm. It means that you're interested. So the motivation isn't necessarily fear. It isn't necessarily, it isn't even necessarily worldly ambition, although that's part of it. What's your goal? But over and above or deeper than that is that fundamental, like, I want to do this. And to create an, an environment. Desire? D desire, yeah, sort of, yeah. Okay. Uh, but desire tends to be a little bit more like a formulated desire and the object of desire. So that's a little bit more the goal type. Okay. This is sort of a little harder to define. It's more abstract, but more pervasive. It's just like, regardless, I just want to do this. Okay. And I can't really put it into words. It's like you felt, you know, I want to get to the club and play. Yeah. And there's a purity of that, uh, which is expressed, I think, I've never lost that about tennis and about people. Yeah. And, and I, have wor um, I have around me a group of, a really great group of, of teachers and the revolving door system. Uh, that we see in a lot of clubs where people are constantly changing, we've somehow managed to create an environment where the same group of people has been working together for a long time. So what's happened as an outflow of that is that we've been able to develop a really unifying and really effective methodology. Okay. It's actually going to come out as the second volume of Noble Tennis. So the philosophy first, yeah. and then the methodology. And that's really sharpened up our teaching, the principles of teaching, the principles of player development, and it's made it more systematic. So basically I've been taking what I was doing sort of instinctively and intuitively with you yeah. and a small group of guys in Kingston, and now we've sort of said, okay, now we're in a much larger setting. We've got 250 kids participating throughout the fall and winter in different levels. So. Um, so how do we make a, a, a structure of a school and a methodology which are good for everybody and all different kinds of goals can be met? And that's been the approach from the beginning. And so that's sort of helped and that's become more and more formed uh, so that uh, it just makes the progress of the players even faster. Right. Yeah. And so like, you know, not everybody's going to be able to, to train with someone like you. You know, um, I think that there are many great coaches, and you would agree, that have their own methods of training, and they all breed success. You know, from the Boletaries and the Rick Macy's of the world to to, to Pierre Lamarche and, and lots of people. Um, what I what I always like try to explain to parents and players is, you know the goal setting of you know and the evaluation i remember when we were working together um, and our goal together was to get me to a college yep. was to get me to a good provincial ranking yeah etc was okay how are we going to do this what do we need to work on yeah and i find that like you know, not everybody's going to get that opportunity with their coach to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, it just doesn't happen everywhere. Right. But if, but do, do you, I feel like they can do it themselves too, or they can in, like add that piece of it mm -hmm. to to the coach and say, look, you know, like if I need to get one level better, can we make my forehand a weapon? And are we going to work on that? And are we going to evaluate that? What do you? What advice can you give to people who are just out there, kind of doing it on their own to some degree? How can they get better? Right. Well, I mean. I feel it, like without without leadership, it's difficult. Okay. Right? Like you have to. Um, it, it's very hard to just sort of be on your own. Uh, I mean, and especially these days, people don't. I mean, part of it is volume, right? Just 
how much time do you spend on the tennis court? Right. How many matches do you play in a, in a year? Um, and and I, think, I think tennis, because of the nature of tennis, it's such a high caliber these days. Uh, even to go to the States, I mean, you would know better than me like how tough the competition yeah, is. Yeah, it's getting tougher and tougher. My impression is that every year it gets harder. That's right. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think if people are, are working on their own, what they should do is go and look for someone to help. But ask the right questions. Okay, you know, so what are some of the questions so they some, should be well, asking? Well, I think some of the questions are, like, if you can go in and say, um, here's what I have in mind, like you and I. Like, yeah. here, here's what I have in mind. I would like to accomplish this. How would you help me go about that? And then see what they say. And if it makes sense, and it doesn't sound like a sales job, but it sounds like this is a knowledgeable person yeah. who says, this is exactly what I think you need to do, um, then then you can then you can give it a try. There's lots of resources out there for coaches, or even if parents are saying, "I got to take a," uh, you know, who's funny. I was talking to a parent the other day and said, "Yeah, we were taking lessons with one of the coaches in Toronto, but then he got too busy and he couldn't." And his daughter had written down all of the content of every lesson they did. Okay. So the father said, "In the meantime, what I've been doing is we go to a court and I just try to reproduce the lesson plan." And he said, "I I I I can't add the corrections the same way the." the coach that we were working with, right. but at least but she's on the something. court, it's structured, we're working on things that somebody who we knew was knew what they were talking about was working on. But like, people are coming up with all kinds of creative ways to yeah. try and follow the path. But I just find with tennis, it's, um, it's uh, one of the elements is good leadership and you just have to walk in there. But if you walk in uh, and saying, here's what I have in mind, yeah. that can help. That can help. A lot. And hope that yeah. they have some good answers, right, right. to those. And also don't forget on the sort of complementary side of that, one of the things, I mean, I'm the guy who, who, who came up with the qualitative approach, but on the other hand, um, anything like that has to be blended with something else so that it doesn't become too extreme in any direction. Right, right. What I'm trying to get at is that simple quantity, like you don't have to be an expert to sit down and say, okay, I want to make, I want to, I want to dramatically improve as a tennis player. How many hours a week do I spend on the tennis court? Right. How many balls do I hit in a week? What am I doing? How many matches am I going to play this year? How am I going to make that happen? So I think to sit down and make things a little more quantitative, yeah. a little more measurable, um, and then if you can find someone that's a good that, that will give some leadership, because there's so much like well you you're leading people through this difficulty of getting a scholarship, right? Right. right. Well, the tennis development landscape is sort of similar. And you go on YouTube, you can hear 10 different things on the same subject, so it, it's, it's difficult. Yeah, so you find somebody that you feel like you can trust and has a good track record yeah. that can help you achieve your goals. Yeah. And then the that's rest... That's ideal. That's ideal, that's yeah. Ideal. And, that, and, and there's things yeah. that you can do, as you right. said. Like, I always tell people there's one thing that, like, you don't need a whole lot of talent or any talent for. Like, you can get your fitness level better. Right. If you become a 10 in fitness, right, right and you become the best at fitness, like, you're going to move up one level naturally, like, right. already. You know, that's one thing that right. will help you move up a level. That's a very and good Point. Right, yeah. and then there's strokes and other it's things. Funny you say that because I know a yeah. lot of people. Uh, um, you know, from my experience, when I've encountered people who have gone to the states and left, one of the reasons why I've heard in the past has been I couldn't believe how much fitness we had to do. Okay, <laughs> yeah. some of the colleges. Yeah, yeah it's just yeah. like. Wow, because they're big on that, right? right? They're not going to change who you are at that point, but at least they can make you so fit that you're going to outlast the other team. It's a big thing yeah. in college tennis. Like, yeah. if your team's more fit than the other team, mm -hmm. that can that can make you the win. Exactly, because you're not you're making minor tweaks, and that's one of them. Like, right. if you go from a nine, if you're doing a one to ten scale, and you're a nine fitness, you become a ten. Right. And that other team's a nine. Like, I mean, you're going you know pound for pound on shots. Right. Like, I mean, anybody can win, but that fitness in the third set breaker. That's right. Might get you the win. That's right. right? You know, it's a hot day. Into to an interview with Federer uh, a while ago and uh, he was saying that uh, in his in his opinion uh, when he really embraced fitness as the key as a, as a key to tennis yeah that was when his tennis really took off in okay. his own opinion and it's funny that we're talking about this because you know we're we're getting ready to to launch uh, another fall program and we're bringing in another sort of another turn of the spiral of the school where we're trying to um, define goals and quantities and and everything more precisely again uh, for different goals and different pathways leading to different things more precisely more professionally and more comprehensively yeah. even though I think they're pretty good as it is but we want to make them better and one of the things that we're doing is bringing in a lot more from an early age where physical training is part of it okay and following the Tennis Canada has the long-term athlete development um, model that they've developed and a really good document you talk about what can people do yeah one thing 
they can do is go onto Tennis Canada and download that document. It is good. Okay. And, um, and this is for anybody, right? Anybody. Like you don't have to be a anybody. Canadian, just read it, right? Even if you're a parent or a player and you're going to talk to somebody about what their program is like, yeah. this will help you to, to have questions at hand. Okay. Um, and, and, and we're just at that point now where, you know, the, the, their, the model that they're proposing, Tennis Canada, is athlete-centered, coach-driven, performance, gradually developmental. Um, and athlete-centered because athleticism demands of tennis is one of the highest of any sports on earth. Yeah. And, and in Canada, we don't. Uh, our schools don't do very much physical education. Not anymore, yeah. Um, kids don't spend all day every day at a park or a seasonal club like we do. Yeah. We used to, like we did. Um, and, and most tennis programs don't include much uh, physical training component uh, until you're like at a sports study and coming in four hours a day. It's almost like we were athletes before because right. we played That's know, right. hockey, baseball, soccer, everything. Mm -hmm. And then tennis was the second afterthought, That's which right. became the first one exactly. after over time. But exactly. not until I was like 12 did I start going to the Kingston Tennis Club where That's I right. moved and spending every day all day there. That's right. But, right? And That's so right. we were already in good shape, we had That's good right. hand-eye coordination, then yeah. we honed those skills very quickly. That's right. And um, I feel like, yeah, now you go out and there's too much emphasis maybe on the initial building of that That's skill, right. not enough physical ability. That's right. Ability. There's, two, there's a whole bunch of problems ranging from societal, educational, right. but also down into tennis programs and just the culture of tennis. Uh, and so much emphasis on early specialization, early results. What do you think about that, by the way? Because you know, early specialization. Because you know, I get families all the time asking me about um, you know my son plays this in sport, yeah. uh, tennis as well as these other yeah. sports, or my daughter does this. Um, you know, when when do we start taking it seriously? I mean, do we have to? Because are we going to not be able to get that scholarship then? I mean, the kids are so much better than right. my kid right now. Yeah. What do you think about that? Well, I think broadly speaking, and yeah. tennis is an individual sport, uh, and so individual situations are different so with that qualification what I will say is that I agree with what with what Tennis Canada is saying in their materials which is that tennis is a sport which ideally has early initiation of the, into the sport and later specialization and and that's for the simple reason that the 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 set of physical skills required to be good at tennis are so diverse, the best way to develop that is to do a whole bunch of different athletic activities. Okay. Now what we're finding is that people in their daily lives, in their school lives, aren't getting that. So the direction that we're going is to make that multi-athletic development, multi-sport even development, part of our program. Okay, so we're that's actually cool. we're actually looking at having yeah. people come in and part of your program is that you do gymnastics once a week and you're not on the tennis court. Yeah. Um, now I'm talking about kids who are in the under eight. We're talking about kids who are six, seven, eight, nine years old. Um, so there has to be a gradual, steady progression, generically, I think. Um, and, and the ideal thing is like, and I've spoken to so many coaches, I spoke to a German coach. Uh, you know, who's high up in their federation a couple of years ago, we had extensive conversations. He said, yeah, we made that mistake after Boris Becker and Steffi Graf. We started throwing everyone in academies age five and six, tennis, 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 tennis. We had nothing after that. People burning out, people not having the right athleticism, people getting injured. Yeah. He said, now we've gone back to the system. It said, get involved in tennis when you're young. Yep. Play enough that you're not becoming a teenager and you don't still don't know what you're doing on a tennis court. So Tony, I want to um, you know finish off by asking you um, to give some insight. You know, you've been in the business for so many years with so much success. What is the best piece of advice you can give to student athletes, juniors that are growing up playing tennis, um, if their dreams are to play, you know, college tennis uh, in the States or they want to become professionals, what do the parents should be doing? What is some feedback and advice you could share with everybody? Right. Um, so I would say there's a few, there's a few key, key pillars. Uh, Number one, never forget throughout the entire thing that the, the culture, the atmosphere has to be correct. Uh, no matter how, because we get lost in goal setting, in quantities, in competition, in results, in performance, all of which has to be included. Uh, but it has to be included in a way that has actual long-term vision. 
uh, and an actual fundamental positivity to it. Even when it's disappointing, even when it's difficult, there's a fundamental underlying current of enthusiasm that has to be there or else the whole thing goes sour. Okay. Um, and then after that, look for leadership uh, based on knowing what it is that you're trying to, to accomplish and uh, trying to find good help. Um, and then when you find when you find an environment in which the in which you can thrive, then um, if, if you're talking to parents, it's like to the to the most part, let the let that process work itself out, support it, and um, and and try to find somewhere that has a sense of here's where you're trying to go, here's how we're going to help you to get there, uh, and that that sounds like it's based in knowledge and care, and not just a sales pitch. Right. Yeah. No, fair enough. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm so happy that you came by to do this with me, um, that we got to meet again, because we don't get to do so so often now that I've been in the States for so many years. But like, I, um, you know, I think a lot of players, once they graduate from the juniors and they go on to play you know, college or, or they do their own thing, start to realize um, how valuable the relationships that they built, like the, a big part of my success has been credit to you. And our relationship from from the from my young age, and the fact that you know you were a mentor, you cared about us, you helped us develop, we shared in the success, and right. and you and you know I, I watched the Boletary, um Showtime recently, Love Means Zero, and you you could see some of the relationships he built or burned um, over time, um, but there was certainly. A amount of respect and like just uh, a fatherly type figure something that you've done for me that I really really appreciate um, that you know when I went to coach tennis and then even afterwards like we keep in touch and I yeah. really uh, um, you know appreciate all that um, advice and I think that mm -hmm. the listeners out there can really um, appreciate all the advice you're giving with your knowledge you have this very different approach to most but it but it makes a lot of sense and a lot of the knowledge that you're giving is what people need to hear and want to want to learn about and um, it, it's it's a testament to to what you you've done um, Thank you. for for everybody listening out there I mean Tony's at the at the Ottawa Athletic Club he's got a great program um, the noble tennis book I actually recommend everybody to read it where can they find it oh um, well they can uh, get it through amazon.com is the simplest way yeah. okay perfect yeah. so amazon.com noble tennis um, Tony Roth from the noble tennis school thanks so much Tony it's Good been to a see pleasure you, Good to see you too